Thank you, Mark, and good morning. Our text this morning is Psalm 135, and um, I'll preach another psalm before the end of December, and we'll have a Christmas message. All of this is to say we'll have various messages throughout the, uh, the month, and then uh, in January we'll start a new series in the book of 1 Timothy, just to let you know. I think some of you are probably curious about where we're going on Sunday morning, and that's the, the schedule. But this morning, it's a great psalm, Psalm 135, psalm of praise, as we will see. So I've named it, Hallelujah, What a Savior. Might be a good way to end our service this morning with that hymn. The psalmist writes, Praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to His name, for it is lovely. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for Himself, Israel for His own possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does, in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deeps. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, who brings forth the wind from his treasuries. He smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into your midst, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He smote many nations and slew mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. And he gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, his people. Your name, O Lord, is everlasting. Your remembrance, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people and will have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are but silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath at all in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them. Yes, everyone who trusts in them. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who revere the Lord, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In 1957, at the insistence of President Dwight Eisenhower, the words, in God we trust, began appearing on our currency, coins and cash, and that phrase became our national motto. It's a good motto, but mostly a false statement. It's the copper and paper on which the words are printed that we as a nation trust. We trust in the God of mammon, wealth, silver, and gold. That's very significant because it has been said, and I think rightly said, that history will probably show that no nation or people has risen above its religion or idea of God. That's the teaching of Psalm 135. After the psalmist mocks the idols, he says, those who make them will be like them. He meant the idols of Baal and Molech and others, but there are idols in our age as well. We worship what we value. Those are the things we set our minds on, and those are the things that shape our thoughts and lives. So the idols we make are the people we become. 
if the writer of Psalm 135 had, had a particular problem, or saw a particular issue that he wanted to correct, it was this problem of idolatry, of trusting in false gods, believing in error and having false hope, which can only end in calamity. But I don't think that is the prime reason he wrote this psalm. He wrote it to praise the one true God. He was full of the knowledge of God and could not help but praise Him. He was full of God's knowledge because he was a diligent student of God's Word. His psalm is almost entirely made up of quotes from other parts of Scripture. One writer called the psalm a mosaic in which the psalmist skillfully placed pieces of Scripture into a pattern of praise. Alexander McLaren compared it to a bouquet of flowers that have been picked for their beauty from various places and arranged in a beautiful harmony. The psalm begins, praise the Lord, and it ends with praise the Lord. In between, the psalmist gives the reasons for the praise, God is sovereign over the world and the Savior of His people. It can be outlined in three parts, verses 1 through 5, an invitation to praise the Lord. Verses 6 through 18, a description of the Lord to be praised. And verses 19 through 21, an invitation to praise the Lord. God is real. The idols are false. God cares for His people, and He should be praised. The Hebrew word for praise is halal. It's the basis for the word hallelujah. So the lesson of the psalm can be summarized in the simple statement, hallelujah, sovereign Savior, hallelujah. Having that conviction is the strongest defense against the idols of our age. God alone should be worshipped. And the psalm begins with a call to do that. Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the name of the Lord. Then in verses 3 and 4, the psalmist gives three reasons for praise. The Lord is good. His name is lovely. And He has chosen Israel. The goodness of the Lord is seen in many ways. He delivered the nation from the iron furnace of slavery in Egypt. He provided for them daily in the wilderness. Then He gave them Canaan for their own land. But really, the greatest act of God's goodness to the people is His election of them. He chose them out of all of the nations of the earth. And so He saved them. You can't separate redemption from election. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. And here the psalmist is quoting Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, to fit into his mosaic of praise. In Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 and 7, Moses explained to Israel why it was that they were such a privileged people, why they had been so blessed why they were God's own possession, His special treasure. How is that? It was because God chose them. Well, the fact that He chose them must say something very good about them. They must be a very special people for God to choose them. They must be a worthy people. No, didn't choose them because they were a large nation or a great and mighty people. Just the opposite. Moses explained that they were the smallest of people. They were the least significant of the nations. If they wanted to know the source or the reason of God's choice of them, they'd never find it in themselves. It's in the Lord God alone. That's what Moses says in verse 8. You were chosen because the Lord loved you. Well, that's quite a thing to say. That's quite a statement. He loved them. 
Why? Why did he love them? Well, the answer is this simple. He loved them because he did. No reason given. Certainly no cause from them to elicit that love. His election of Israel or anyone is due to the mystery of his own unfathomable, unconditional love alone. And we see that here in the psalm. He chose Jacob. The psalmist is speaking of Jacob collectively, not only of him personally, but of his descendants, his nation. But the name Jacob recalls the scheming of the patriarchs, how, uh, the patriarch, how he cheated his brother Esau and deceived his father Isaac. His name means supplanter. Is he not rightly called Jacob? Esau bitterly complained. That's what God chooses. He chooses the lowly, the despised, the unworthy. His election is unconditional. It is undeserved. But it doesn't end there. He who chooses us then changes us. Later, Jacob was named Israel, a name of honor indicating that this is what God's election has as its goal, the transformation of fallen guilty people into a new and glorious creation. What he chooses for his own possession, he blesses. That's the goodness of God. The Lord is a God who does the miraculous. He is the only God and the one alone who is worthy of to be praised. And so, in verses 5 through 18, the psalmist explains who the Lord is that men should praise Him and why they should praise Him. First, He's omnipotent. He's, he's all-powerful. Second, He is the Savior. And third, He is the only God. In verses 5 through 7, the Lord is described as sovereign over the natural world. And the psalmist introduces that with a statement of confidence in what he says. He begins, I know, for I know that the Lord is great. That is, a, it, that is emphatic in the verse. It is stressed in the verse. The psalmist had complete assurance of the Lord's existence and His rule over the whole realm of nature. No doubt about it. He was absolutely certain of that, confident of that, and He expands on it. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, makes lightnings for the rain, brings wind, brings the wind from His treasuries. He does whatever He pleases in heaven and in earth, in the seas, and in all depths. Now that was a bold statement for the psalmist to make, a statement of faith that directly contradicted the ancient world, its worldview, because it was a polytheistic world. The Gentiles worshipped nature gods that they believed caused the rain and the wind. Baal, for example, was the storm god, often represented with a lightning bolt in his hand, like Zeus. But the psalmist said, it was the Lord who caused the lightning. It's the Lord who causes the weather and everything else in the world. All of the cycles of nature, the seasons, the harvest, all of it was caused by the Lord God. He alone is the creator and the sustainer of the earth and all that inhabit it. Where does a man get the confidence to say, the whole world is wrong. I know I have the truth. How does a person get such assurance? By being a careful student of the Word of God. This psalm reflects that. It's not a unique song springing from the psalmist's heart, but a composition of a number of passages, a mosaic of various verses, it's the result of the psalmist reflecting deeply on the Word of God. He believed it. That's the source of assurance, 
the study of Scripture. We've gone over this before. Again, Romans 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Know the Bible and you will know truth. You'll know God's revelation. There's no greater truth in the universe than what's contained in this book. You will be light in the darkness and a bold servant of the Lord able to stand against the world. That was the psalmist. He was an ancient Athanasius. Athanasius stood against the Arians of his day when that heresy swept through the church like a, a California wildfire. He was known as Athanasius against the world. And by God's grace, he prevailed against that terrible error. He and the psalmist believed in a great God who does whatever he pleases. He's not subject to the laws of nature or the will of man. He acts according to his own good pleasure and cannot be frustrated. Knowing that we walk with him will give boldness. Now that is reason to praise the Lord as the psalmist invites us to do. The Lord is sovereign over nature. He guides the world by His all-wise providence and power. We can rest in Him. We can trust Him. Next, in verses 8-14, through 14, the psalmist narrows the scope of praise to the Lord's personal care for His chosen people when He reviews history to show that the Lord is the Savior. First speaks of his chosen people's deliverance from Egypt, then of their establishment in Canaan. Verse 8, he smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into your midst, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. The death of the firstborn was the last of the ten plagues, and all of them were judgments on the gods of Egypt. If you look at the plagues of Egypt, you see each one of them refers to a god. The, the Nile was a god that they worshipped. They worshipped it because it was the water that, that gave uh, them the crops that they had. And so God turns it into blood, and they couldn't reverse that. They worshipped bugs. The scarab is one of the gods of Egypt, the dung beetle. Well, he sent them bugs. He sent them flies, and they couldn't get rid of them. They had a god that was a frog god. And so frogs start hop hopping out of the Nile and they fill their house and their kneading bowls and their beds. Can you imagine getting in bed and your feet touch a couple of frogs? If it happened to me, I'd have hit the ceiling. <laughs> That's what he, he filled the land with these things they worshipped and they plagued them all to demonstrate that he's in control, not those false gods. In fact, it all showed their nothingness. And it all proves that the fate of nations is with the Lord God, not the mighty kings or armies of the world. Pharaoh was the greatest monarch of his day, and he had the greatest army of his day. He too was worshipped as a god. He opposed the Lord God and he was drowned in the sea with all of his chariots. And so by his power, he delivered his people from slavery, proving that he alone is the Savior. He freed the slaves, and by that same power, he gave them a land of their own. He made them a nation. It happened by many victories over the kings of Canaan. Verse 10, he smote many nations and slew mighty kings. The psalmist refers to two in particular, Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. They were mighty kings. The, the first that Israel fought, Og was a giant. But God told Moses, do not fear him, for I have delivered him and all his people and his land into your hand. The victory is yours. I've given it to you. Those kings were conquerors themselves, but Israel conquered their lands and their cities with their high walls. 
all by the irresistible power of God. The Israelites fought the battles. God didn't direct them to be uh, inactive. And by application, we too are to be very active in the Christian life and the spiritual battles that we fight. That involves wisdom and effort. We are not passive agents in life. We are responsible to work wisely, diligently, obediently. But we do so trusting the Lord because as we act in obedience, He blesses us. That's the assurance we have. The, the assurance that the Lord gave Moses and Israel, do not fear, I have given them into your hand. And that's the assurance that we have every day as we walk out of our doors to go to work or wherever. Every day we have the assurance that the Lord has given the victory to us. We're simply to walk in it and we can do that and we can have that confidence only because He is absolutely sovereign. And because He is, He blesses us. Blesses His people. He blessed Israel. That's what the psalmist said next in verses 12 through 14. He gave the land of Canaan to them as their heritage or inheritance. In fact, at the end of the book of Joshua, the Lord told the people, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities which you had not built and you have lived in them. They didn't earn their inheritance. One does not earn an inheritance. It was God's gift to them. All glory goes to Him. That's what the psalmist said. Your name, O Lord, is everlasting. Your remembrance, O Lord, throughout all generations. That's what His people will do throughout the ages. They will remember Him. They will remember Him in worship and in praise. That's really what we will do for all eternity as we grow in our understanding and appreciation of the greatness and glory and holiness of our God, which we will have unimpeded by sin. There won't be any of that. And we will grow exponentially in our knowledge and appreciation and praise of the Lord. So that's what the psalmist is calling us to do now. To praise Him for His great works, His grace and mercy. It's not only that He governs all of nature and all the nations, but He governs us also and governs, governs us wisely and well. In verse 14, the writer says, He will judge His people and will have compassion on His servants. That means He will be sorry for them. That's the idea in compassion. He will judge our deeds and deal with us when we go astray. He must as a holy God, but He must as a good and loving Father. He deals with sin. But then, when there is repentance, and that is the purpose of discipline, bringing the wayward back into the right way, then He feels sorry. That is, He has compassion on us. And He's always that way. Verse 13, His name, meaning His character, whenever you read that word name, Shem, of God, it's speaking of who He is. It's not simply this is the appellation, this is the, uh, the word that identifies Him, Lord, Yahweh, El, Elohim, these kind of things. It says something about him. It defines who he is, his person, his character. And his character here is described as everlasting. It, it, it is immutable, unchangeable. Sovereignty, predestination is not fatalism, which is blind and arbitrary. God's sovereignty is purposeful. It is directed toward redeeming and blessing his people. So, God is reliable. He is consistent, always compassionate. That's His character toward His people. So we should praise Him for that. For His character and kindness, He is good. He is also true. He is real. That is another reason to praise Him. He is the only God. All other so-called deities are false. 
That's what the next verses show, verses 15 through 17. Israel belonged to the one true God who is sovereign, wise, and good. He is merciful and majestic, while the Gentiles have blocks of wood and stone for gods. They do nothing and are nothing. That's the description the psalmist gives in verses 15 through 17. The idols of the nations are but silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath at all in their mouths. The description is taken from Psalm 115. And what the psalmist and the prophets were saying to the idolaters is, what you see is what you got and nothing more. Wood, stone, silver, gold, without life, without power. Spurgeon told about a missionary to India named John Thomas who was traveling through the countryside when he saw a large number of people gathering at the temple of an idol. He went up to them, and as soon as the doors were opened, he walked in. Seeing the idol raised above them, he walked up boldly to that idol, held up his hand to the, the worshipers there, asked for silence, and then he put his his fingers to the eyes and said, it has eyes, but it cannot see. It has ears, but it cannot hear. It has a nose, but it cannot smell. It has hands, but it cannot handle. It has a mouth, but it cannot speak. Neither is there any breath in it. It was a bold thing he did. It was a dangerous thing he did. But in, instead of attacking him, an old Brahmin was so convinced of his folly by what was said that he also cried out, it has feet, but it cannot run away. And the people became ashamed and left the temple because of their stupidity. Idols are nothing. They are the product of man's imagination. They have no breath, no life. But over the millennia and over the world, these imaginary things have enslaved people in lies and false hope. In one of his letters of spiritual counsel, Luther quoted a Latin proverb that was common in his day, the translation of which is, imagination produces misfortune. He was applying that to people who were anxious and despondent and telling them not to let their imagination run wild because they will believe things that are not true. They will fear things that do not exist, that aren't there. That's good advice. But it is even more profoundly true of idols that are the product of fallen, corrupt human imagination. Following imagination in religion produces the greatest misfortune. When I read Spurgeon's story about John Thomas, I thought of being in Rome and standing outside the Scala Sancta, which supposedly houses the stairway on which Pilate stood and sentenced Jesus to death. Catholic pilgrims from all over the world gather there each day, waiting for the doors to open so they can crawl up the stairs kiss each step as they go up on their knees, praying their paternosters. I've been there. I've watched it. I thought of Luther. He did that as a monk, and he did it with devotion. It's a famous story that took place during his one pilgrimage to Rome. And he got on his knees, and he began to go up those steps, praying the prayers in order to release his grandfather from purgatory. By the time he gets to the top, he's puzzled by it all. And he says, who knows whether it is so? And all of it, doubt was in his mind about it. It's a religion that has a system of merit, the product of imagination, not revelation. There's much about the Roman Catholic Church that we agree with. 
their doctrine of the Trinity, their view of the virgin birth, their, their at least conviction of the virgin birth, much doctrine that we would agree with. But when it comes to the doctrine of salvation, they hold to what's called sacerdotalism. They hold to what, what means, which means they hold to a belief that you're saved by the sacraments, by the works that you do, by the things and the ceremonies that you follow. That's a work of imagination, not revelation. And Luther came to realize that, and when he did, his life changed. From one of labor, frustration, and sorrow to one of salvation, freedom, and joy. Imagination produces misfortune, especially when it's the imagination of idols, of false worship. No nation or people has risen above its religion or idea of God. What people worship affects their character, it affects their behavior, and ultimately it affects their destiny. People become like their idols. That's what the psalmist says in verse 18. Those who make them will be like them. Yes, everyone who trusts in them. When we think of idols, we naturally think of statues of stone or wood like here in the psalm. And that still exists in all parts of the world. In the West, though, idolatry is of a different kind. Men today are materialists. They worship the god of mammon, of money and power, just to name uh, some of the obvious gods of our age. Modern man doesn't think of money as a god, but it is. What men serve is what they worship. What is most important to them is their God because that is what they trust in. Man is, is uh, naturally religious. Every man, every man and woman, every person in this world is going to worship something, is going to serve something. That's what Calvin meant when he called the human heart an idol factory. There's no void there. There's no vacuum there. It will be filled with something that men and women worship. But idolatry is both foolish and selfish. Foolish because it's believing a lie and a demonstrably false lie, as these words in verses 15 through 17 show. An idol cannot do anything. It's foolish to worship such a thing. They can't deliver in the day of distress. If I had a dollar in my pocket, I could pull it out and point to George and say, it has eyes, but it cannot see. It has ears, but it cannot hear. It has a mouth, but it cannot speak. It has a nose and a nice nose, but it cannot smell. We can carry it in our pocket but it can't carry us. We can buy some things with it, but they're very temporal. They don't last. It cannot deliver from the great distress. So-called gods of Egypt could not deliver Pharaoh from the plagues that God sent upon him and his land. And no amount of money can keep you from the grave or open heaven's door for you. It's foolish to trust in idols. It is foolish because it leads to corrupt and destructive behavior. Things that occupy our thoughts affect us. They shape us. And when it is error that is believed, the consequence is misfortune and ultimately eternal misfortune. Idolatry is foolish, but idolatry is also selfish because it ignores and rejects the very one who gives the idolater or materialist his or her every breath and every moment in this world of life. Unbelievers breathe God's air every day. Unbelievers have their feet on God's firm ground every moment. They enjoy the warmth of His Son and the satisfaction and nourishment of his food, and they utter not one word of thanks or praise. Ingratitude. That's a problem in every generation. 
the gross selfishness of mankind. Psalmist no doubt saw that in his generation and wrote his hymn of praise to the Lord in the hope that in giving praise to the Lord that he would awaken people to the true God and the truth of God, who he is and move them to praise him. He knew the Lord and he couldn't help but praise him himself. So he he ends the psalm in that way. He ends it as he began. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who revere the Lord, Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. This may be a call to antiphonal singing in the temple, responsive singing between these groups in which they give glory to God who, for who He is and what He has done as the sovereign Savior. But however this response of worship occurred, it, as Derek Kidner wrote, bears no comparison with the blessing that the Lord imparted to them and imparts to us. When we understand what He has done, how He has blessed us and who He is, we cannot help but praise, bless, glorify, and thank Him. That's what the psalmist did and what he wanted to move us to do. And of all the great things God has done, along with absolute freedom and sovereignty to govern all nature and people from weather to politics, um, the greatest thing that he has done and is doing, uh, that, he has, that he has done, and we sing hallelujah, what a Savior, Lord, because salvation is of the Lord. It's your work from beginning to end. Only by your grace do we receive your Son as our Savior, like one opens his hand or her hand to receive a gift. We thank you for that. Thank you that you're the Savior and you save many. We thank you that you saved us if we're believers and we pray that we'll live for you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.